Well, the book is called The Great West Ukrainian Prison Massacre of 1941, as you said, and it's a source book. It's a collection of uh, already published materials dealing with this particular atrocity. Uh, it's about 430 or so pages long, and it contains documents, essays, eyewitness accounts, and newspaper accounts, along with photographs. And the documents, and for instance, so and, and in each of these cases, the um, um, we have documents, we have essays and so on by Ukrainians, by Poles, by the Nazi authorities, by the Soviet authorities, by Jews from the from Halachina, as well as, of course, by academics who have written to a greater or lesser extent about these issues. The documents are republished in the original languages. Uh, so the German documents are in German, the Russian are in Russian, the Ukrainian are in Ukrainian, and so on. Uh, the only exception is materials that were published either in Hebrew or in Yiddish, those we published in English language translation. But other than that, there are several languages that, rep that are represented in the volume. And then Ksenia Kebuzinski and I, we wrote an introductory essay of about 50, 60 pages, which is fairly intense and fairly exhaustive, and it talks about the background and tries to put many of these issues and themes together. It's, it's been largely underplayed or ignored. Um, but again, it depends on what you're looking at. There's a fairly extensive collection of memoirs, uh, especially by Ukrainians, Poles, and Jews, dealing with the massacres. Um, but as I said, they're in the original languages. Amongst academics, there are fairly few publications. Um, you know, so Timothy Snyder devotes a page, a page and a half in his book, The Bloodlands. Other authors, like Oresh Subtelny, the light, late Subtelny, devoted about five or six pages, somewhat more. Some other authors devote a page, a paragraph or two, and so on. And again, it depends. This is the English language literature, the, the Polish language literature, and so on. But in general, it's been neglected. And what we, I think what we've managed to accomplish is we've put in, we've put together all of this very disparate material that is scattered around the documentation, the memoirs, the newspaper accounts, the photographs, the academic articles, um, and we put it into one source. And that, I think, is the primary contribution of what we've done. And now, this enormous atrocity, which really deserves far more attention for all sorts of reasons, um, it can no longer be ignored. That's really the bottom line, I think. Uh, and certainly scholars won't be able to ignore it, but I think, you know, even people will at least be more attentive to the fact that this, uh, that this took place. After, the, after Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, um, the Soviet secret police, before withdrawing, as the Soviets withdrew, uh, they initiated a series of whole-scale massacres of political prisoners in West Ukrainian prisons, and to a lesser extent in Belarusian and other prisons, but it was primarily in West Ukrainian. Um, they tortured people, they mutilated the bodies, and as I said, they killed somewhere between 10 and 40,000. The best the most reliable estimates, the ones that we believe are most reliable, are probably about 25,000. It could be a little more, it could be a little less, but roughly 25,000, which means that in that week between June 22nd and the end of the month, those seven, eight days, the Soviet NKVD, the Soviet secret police, slaughtered about 25,000 people, 
which amounts to around three and a half to 4,000 people a day. Some of them were machine gunned. In some instances, uh, grenades were thrown into uh, cells. In some instances, they were knocked over the head and dumped into salt mines. In very many instances, as I said, there's evidence of uh, mutilation, of torture, eyes being gouged out, genitals being cut off, these sorts of things. So there was obviously torture and it was premeditated. Um, and then the Soviets usually hid the bodies in fairly shallow graves. And this, mind you, is in, towards the end of June. It's very hot. The bodies begin decomposing. And as the Germans enter these towns, and there are anywhere from 30 to 40 such towns where the bodies were laid, um, the bodies are uncovered. They're rotten. They're rotting. The stench, the smell. Um, and this, of course, created quite an uproar amongst the local communities. Um, we, uh, we determined, based on the sources, that of the deaths, roughly 70 to 75 percent were likely Ukrainians, most likely Ukrainian political prisoners, because there was a wave of arrests of nationalists in the second, first half of 1941. Uh, about 20% were Poles. About 3, 4, 5% appeared to have been Jews. And then another, say, 5% were other. Um, one of the reasons, so in addition to being such a tragedy, and as you can well imagine, the outrage that people experienced upon seeing the the bodies, the stench, recognizing their families and friends, one of the very unfortunate consequences of this was that it also spurred some individuals to engage in anti-Jewish violence. And in the immediate aftermath of these uncoverings, there were a series of violent attacks on Jews who were held to be responsible, um, although, as I said, they were victims as well, in a variety of cities and towns of western Ukraine. This issue of the violence has been somewhat discussed, but it's been usually discussed divorced from the massacre. Um, and what we're saying, one of, I think one of our major contributions is to suggest that these two atrocities, these two events, have to be seen side by side. That the massacre was a fundamental cause of the subsequent violence. But it wasn't just about crazy anti-Semitic Ukrainians. It was about very angry Ukrainians and Poles, by the way. There's evidence to suggest that the violence was also committed by Poles. So what we've done in the book, as I said, is we've put this, we've first of all isolated this massacre, given it the attention it deserves, and then placed it in a larger context which illuminates both Soviet and German policy, but also examines some of the consequences. Well, remember, most of these people were political. These were, would have been nationalists of one kind or other, including Jewish and Polish and Ukrainian nationalists. Um, the Soviets, um, they deported a significant portion of the prison population as the Germans attacked. And those that they weren't able to evacuate, to deport, they simply shot. And the reason, as you said, is precisely because the, this would have been an anti-Soviet and a very active anti-Soviet element. These are people who would have taken up the struggle against the Soviet Union. There's no question about it. So they were shot, killed. But what's striking is that they were also tortured and mutilated. And that suggests that there was a special kind of animus that the NKVD had toward these people. Uh, this wasn't just killing people to make sure that they are silent. This was actually a personal, if you like, this was almost a personal form of aggression uh, intended to show the NKVD's hatred 
of these individuals? Well, there were several things that struck me. One is that in a number of instances, the Soviets started killing, and then there were rumors of the German advance, or there was actually the Germans were advancing occasionally, and then the Soviets retreated. A day or so later, when they saw that the Germans hadn't seized the town, they returned to finish the job. Again, that too illustrates the degree to which they had a particular animus. It wasn't enough to kill some of them. One had to destroy all of them. Thorough, very, very thorough. Dr. Kibuzinski played a very important role in this process. Without her, the book would have never appeared. Uh, she isolated and found an enormous number of documents. Um, and then with her facilities at the University of Toronto, she was able to scan all, of, well, virtually all of the documents. Uh, so that saved us an enormous amount of time. We didn't have to retype them. They were simply scanned. But of course, that did mean that we, plus a team of her assistants, had to examine each document very carefully and proofread it. Because as I said, the documents are appearing in their original. Um, so, and, and we wanted them to appear in the original so that people get a sense of the actual language that people used. Uh, of course, the downside is that some people may not have all those languages, but the upside is they will actually have the real live sources. In terms of the table of contents, as I said, we begin with about 60 or so pages of a fairly detailed introduction, examining the issues, um, looking at various problems and methodological errors and things of that sort. Um, and then the volume is simply arranged according to particular approaches. So it starts with academic articles by in English, in Ukrainian, in Polish, there's one or two in Russian, I believe. Um, and those are sometimes the entire article, parts of articles, parts of books, excerpts, and so on. So we begin with that, then we move on to eyewitness accounts. I mean, there were survivors, uh, so they wrote about their experiences. Um, we then focus on uh, memoirs. Right? There are also memoirs that deal with this. I mean, those are related to the eyewitness accounts, but are perhaps a little somewhat removed. There are documents. There is a plethora of documents by the Gestapo, by the SS, by the Soviet NKVD, and other such institutions, which actually document many of these atrocities. Um, and they corroborate one another. That's the important thing. So the Nazi documents corroborate the Soviet documents. Um, and when that happens, you can be pretty sure that they're talking about the same thing. Um, and then we have a section dealing with newspaper accounts from that particular period, from June and July, some by the Ukrainian diaspora press, mostly by UPI, AP, and other such institutions. And then there's an appendix with photographs. I believe there are about 25 photographs uh, that is, the, the, they are very powerful, um, n not for the faint of heart, I can tell people right away. The Nazis, by and large, mobilized Jews uh, to pull out the corpses. Um, and, and again, so you have this interesting, well, tragic confluence, right? So on the one hand, you have an atrocity, there is grief, there is trauma, there is anger, on the other hand, the Nazis are coming in with their own anti-Semitic agenda. And then on the third hand, you have some Ukrainians, some Poles, others. Um, and again, it's unclear as to who these people are. I mean, there's lots of very divergent information. I mean, some of them may have been nationalists. A lot of them seem to have been, quote, riffraff. Uh, some of them may have been peasants. In any case, uh, people who are angry and who take advantage and who sees this opportunity to engage in violence, right? Uh, so, you you know, roughly, you know, from the end of, well, roughly from, say, June 22nd through the middle of July, 
uh, Western Ukraine is a very, very tragic area uh, where you have death and destruction and violence and counter-violence. Um, it's, it's all quite distressing. Um, and what we try to do is to put both sides into this again. So it doesn't just talk about Ukrainian losses, nor does it just talk about Polish losses, nor does it just talk about Jewish losses. That's what you usually find, by the way, in most of the articles. That's, by the way, one of the other surprising things. Ukrainians tend to talk about the Ukrainian tragedy, Poles talk about the Polish tragedy, and Jews talk about the Jewish tragedy. But the reality is that these three tragedies were all interconnected. Uh, they were taking place at the same place at the same time, oftentimes for the same reasons. So what we try to do is to bring these tragedies together um, in order to enhance understanding of what happened leading up to the massacre and what sort of impact the massacre then had on relations between Ukrainians, Poles, and Jews. When Dr. Kibuzinski and I began and then worked on the project, I mean, the idea was to create a source, a base, of, a source base, a source book, in other words, which would present in as objective a manner as possible. I mean, we tried, whether we succeeded, we'll see. Uh, but it provides a plethora of information from a variety of perspectives. So you've got the Ukrainian, the Jewish, the Polish, the Soviet, the Nazi, if you like. I mean, everybody's perspective is in this, and it's represented in the academic works, the documents, the eyewitness accounts, the survivors. Um, and we think we found some patterns and trends and important issues, and we highlighted those in the introduction. But the ultimate goal is for historians, but also, you know, readers, educated readers, to read this and to learn what happened. And then they can make up their own minds as to, you know, who was more responsible, who was less responsible, who suffered more, who suffered less. That's, that's, th those aren't the issues that concerned us. We simply wanted to bring this massacre, this awful, awful massacre, to people's attention. I think with this book, one can no longer pretend that this didn't happen nor can one write the, a history of World War II, or at least the beginnings of World War II, without drawing at least some attention to the massacre. So that was the goal. It was about 40 or so. We actually have a map with the, with the actual cities, with our lists. Uh, a variety of scholars, especially Ukrainian scholars, they've, they've looked closely at prisons in particular towns, and they've tried to reconstruct how many people were imprisoned at the time, how many seem to have been killed. Uh, so there are lists. I mean, we have lists of the places. Are the lists complete? Not clear. Is the list of prisoners killed complete? Not clear. And hence the divergent estimates. Um, the lowest estimate is essentially the Soviet NKVD estimate. And we can imagine that they had good reason to depress the numbers. Um, the highest estimate, uh, I mean, there's actually one estimate that says that they might have been 200,000. Well, that just seems unrealistic given the population size. Um, and based on our research and based on the consensus of scholars, as I said, it seems to be somewhere between 20 and 30. And 25 seems about right. There seems to be a lot of evidence to suggest that it was around 25. I don't think Senya and I will be doing that. You know, this was a grueling experience. We, we worked on this for about three, four years. And let me tell you, there's nothing more depressing than, uh, than focusing all your attention on corpses. Uh, it's just, it, it really, I mean, there are better ways to spend your life. So I think we did what we needed to do. And at this point, I think it's up to students, scholars, journalists, others, to pick up the ball and to proceed with this. And there are lots of questions. You know, there are lots of very fascinating questions that really need to be focused on in greater detail. Um, you know, so who, I mean, amongst others, for instance, um, amongst the NKVD, who were the perpetrators? 
I mean, there are actually some 15 or 20 names. We know of about 15 or 20 people who are repeated and who are mentioned in documents. So we can be pretty certain that these are individuals who would qualify as war criminals. They can't be brought to justice, but they can at least be termed war criminals. But the shooting and the burning and the maiming and the mutilating was done by hundreds, if not thousands. Is it possible to determine who these people are? That would be interesting. Um, and then another question, just to go to the flip side of the coin, the violence that erupted afterwards, the anti-Jewish violence. Who were those people? Right? I mean, some scholars automatically say, well, it was the Ukrainians. Well, we know that it was also the Poles. But to say it was the Ukrainians or the Poles doesn't say anything. Who were they? Uh, was this organized? Was this spontaneous? Were these riffraff? Were these intellectuals? Um, you know, there are hints to suggest that they were riffraff, as I said. Uh, but it's not clear. Uh, so some more research on this, on the question of perpetrators on both sides, needs to be done. And then, of course, just simply factoring in this atrocity, this enormous atrocity, into our evaluations of how Ukrainians, Poles, and Jews responded to German and Soviet occupation. As you can well imagine, when the Germans came and uncovered these atrocities, they presented themselves as the heroes. Now, of course, they weren't. Uh, but clearly, it was, certainly, it was certainly the case that many Ukrainians saw them as liberators. And one of the reasons they saw them as liberators is precisely because of this enormous massacre. And at the same time, many Ukrainians welcomed the Soviets in 1939. But by 1941, after the massacre, I don't think there was a single Ukrainian in Western Ukraine who had anything good to say about the Soviets which also helps account for the intensity of Ukraine, West Ukrainian hatred and opposition to the Soviets, why people fought them in, in the UPA and the Divizia and other institutions, because they knew that if the Soviets came back, this is what was going to happen. So anyway, these are, but, but as I said, we, we touch upon these issues in our introduction. We say that this is important, that someone, but, but at the same time, you know, we're essentially saying, here's the material, here's the ideas, here are, here are the issues, run with the ball now.